John Shepard. John, I, I have had several conversations with people, with ophthalmologists, obviously, uh, about dealing with uncomfortable patients, with patients who present with, uh, with dry eye symptoms, with pain, and how to manage pain, and pain management, and blah, 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 all of that stuff. It's an important item, and I'm not ignoring it. But the patients who are far worse off are those who have no pain, who have nothing, no sensation at all, those patients with neurotrophic keratitis. These are very, very, I don't have to tell you, these are very, very difficult patients to uh, manage. But I understand from our little conversation off screen that there are going to be some new treatment vectors. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely, Josh. You've hit a nail on the head, and that's that these are very, very difficult patients, they're underserved, they have a poor prognosis. And until recently, we really had no specific therapy for NK, neurotrophic keratitis. We have some very effective therapies. Now, my regimen for the patient with neurotrophic keratitis, who very likely has herpetic disease, herpes simplex, and worse, herpes zoster, has been a mixture of anti-inflammatories, ocular surface support, and intensive chronic, perhaps lifetime, antivirals. And this works in a number of cases. It produces reasonable results. The goal is stability. The goal is avoiding flare-ups and preventing worsening. But now we have a variety of newer technologies available to us that may undermine that mindset and allow us to seek to improve the patients who have at least not created permanent damage in their corneas. And in the neurotrophic cornea, sensation is absent. We test that with Q-tip swabs, with dental floss, or if you're so endowed, a Cochet Bonnet anesthesiometer. And these patients don't feel anything, and they don't heal. And in my practice, they'll present with a horrible corneal ulcer from Pseudomonas or fungus at an advanced stage, because it doesn't hurt in the beginning. Tragic. And they're invariably axial and affect the vision horribly. So we've used intervention with antivirals. We have good antivirals now, topically and most importantly, systemically. And we have new technologies to deliver healing natural substances. We use amniotic membranes for so many of these patients. And the cryopreserved amniotic membranes are available in contact lens form and sutured form. And they contain regenerative and anti-scarring and healing and restorative and anti-collagenolytic properties that aid and abet these patients, prevent, inhibit, or even reverse scarring, and prevent ectasia, and therefore refractive abnormalities. The introduction two years ago of neurostimulation promises a modification of the denervation of these patients. Neurostimulation directly emulates the natural afferent pathway that allows us to produce tripartite tears. So through this lacrimal functional unit, we can produce the liquid aqueous and the oil and the mucin goblet cell products of the natural tear film. So we have this additional means to stimulate nerves to do their job better in people who are otherwise deficient. And truly, viral disease annihilates corneal nerves. It's different in every patient, but these can be severely frustrating recalcitrant cases. And the, the lesions are generally in the center of the cornea where the epithelium is most mature and farthest away from the limbal stem cells. So we have had much better served patients. We have the advent of scleral lens technology from many skilled practitioners. This is not just a, a niche market anymore. And the scleral lenses allow a interface tear film to touch the cornea rather than the hard surface of an RGP lens or the oxygen impermeable soft contact lens. So this combination of therapies has worked very well with special attention to removing all preservatives from the tear film in terms of medicinal intervention. But now we have a nerve growth factor. It's called synedrimin. And in topical form over an intensive eight-week course, we can actually directly treat and target the underlying cause of the neurotrophic keratitis. And that's nerve deficiency, nociceptor depletion and trigeminal insufficiency. And this occurs not only with herpetic eye disease, but from trigeminal disease, trigeminal transections in surgical procedures for trigeminal neuralgia, accidents, and chemical injuries, and then 
very commonly we're seeing with diabetes mellitus, Parkinsonism, and other systemic diseases that further uh, down-regulate this nerve function. So the application of a course of the nerve growth factor, the synedrimin, replenishes the epithelium, the ability of the eye to heal, as well as the nerves themselves. So now we kind of have a combination therapy where we can attack this horrible disease from many, many different points of view. The old treatment, tarsorophy. Close the eye, they get better, they can't see, and they're very mad about their appearance. So for an emergency, perhaps a conjunctival flap or the suturing of the lens can buy us some time, but now we have such better treatments that can actually reverse changes in the cornea and restore vision to these otherwise blind patients and severely compromised patients. An exciting time. Yeah, John, that was, the, the, the disposition was, was, was wonderful. You didn't, I, I'm just sitting here listening, I'm sure you're listening too. This is wonderful stuff. Um, uh, one brief question, then one one longer question. So the the neurostimulation that you mentioned, that's the, the nasal neurostimulation that, yes. that, that, that you're talking about. Correct. So I, I've 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 prescribed that uh, for dry eye patients. I've never. I mean, I don't have a big neurotrophic keratitis practice. I have some patients, uh, but I've never used it in that in that that, that context. Um, some of the therapies. Uh, so my question is. How, what, what is your sort of therapeutic treatment ladder for these patients? Or how do you come up with a treatment plan for a, a, a particular patient? But I want to flavor this with, with a, 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 an important sort of real world thing, which is, is that some of these treatments are entirely out of pocket, uh, or there's, there's no coverage for scleral lenses are not cheap. Um, other things like, um, like amniotic membrane contact lenses uh, coverage doesn't seem to be a big problem. Um, so, ha so how do you decide upon a particular regimen for a patient? And then more specifically, with amniotic contact lenses, they, they come in different thicknesses. How do you choose which thickness to use? So you're very correct. There's always a fiscal challenge. The synedrimin is covered by insurance. There's a central oh, I didn't know that. that handles yeah. that called a credo. The amniotic membrane contact lenses are covered by insurance universally. And generally speaking, we'll use the, the single thickness membrane in, in severe cases where you know they'll need to stay in a long period of time and they're so neurotrophic that they don't feel the ring, yes, you can do the plus thickness and apply that. And in even more desperate cases, you can suture in the amniotic membrane in the operating room for patients where a visual compromise is not as much of an issue as the healing itself. So we do have insurance coverage, and you know, preservative-free drops and medications are generally really not that expensive. So we have a lot of affordable tools. On the other hand, the scleral contact lens is expensive. And I've seen just in the last five years is there's so many more providers, the costs come down from the 3,000 to the 1,500 range, generally speaking, in our market. So there's an encouragement there as well. But the, the regimen we choose is so individualized. And it, that encourages me that our profession will remain necessary for at least another few decades because you have to titrate it to the patient's fiscal needs, as you so correctly pointed out, and you have to titrate it to the severity of the disease, the age of the patient. Younger patients heal faster. And if you can match the needs of the patient to the therapies, you're doing your job. But a general principle is apply one technology at a time in these complex cases. Because if you remove something, add something, and subtract something, you can tell what works. Yeah. You don't know what's going on. Yeah. You have to be very scientific about these difficult patients. This, this, is, this is great stuff. And let me hold your feet to the fire with just one thing, though. So uh, the, 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 the idea of a, of a topical neurotrophic growth factor, although I, I've discussed it with people in our research context before, is new to me in, in actual real clinical use. Is that a, a go-to therapy for you? Is that something that is, is you hold in, in, in reserve? How, how early do you introduce that? That is the essence of medical care because you know that early intervention for any condition works better than desperate late intervention. Proactive as opposed to reactive care. So should we get patients at the very beginning of this process where they haven't scarred and they haven't shown any ectasia and they look pretty good, but they're clearly neurotrophic in one eye and predict that within a year they're going to have a disaster? Or do we wait for their 
disease to become almost disastrous and intervene with this relatively expensive but covered therapy. So that, that is a really important question. In, in a cornea practice, you tend to receive those patients who have you know, been through five doctors, 17 therapies, and are thinning and have axial involvement. So that's clearly too late. So awareness in the community and educating our colleagues to test for corneal sensation, because it's those patients who don't blink who are, allow you to applinate their pressure when you've forgotten to give them the anesthetic, who hold their eye wide open for whatever minor procedure you might want to perform and have unilateral disease with early haze. This is where you may want to intervene because I've seen corneal haze, as we said, which is invariably axial and therefore deleterious for the vision, reverse with early intervention with any number of these modalities that we've discussed. And of course, some of them are totally paid for by the patient. Neurostimulation is cash pay. So are the contact lenses. And for that matter, so are preservative-free compounded drops. We use a lot of preservative-free dexamethasone, but it's affordable. On the other hand, we have preservative-free amniotic membrane extracts, which are very expensive, and we have serum tears, which are not covered by insurance and tend to be very expensive and laborious and sometimes increase the risk of infection. So there's so many choices. They can be matched to the patient's needs and through careful discussion and planning with the patient and their family, you can come up hopefully with the right regimen for that patient sitting in your chair today. John, this is great stuff. I, I've, learned, I've learned more in this, 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 this conversation than, I, I've learned enough in this conversation that this whole meeting was worthwhile for me. Uh, I, I wanna thank you for making this, this super complex uh, topic seem uh, clear. And uh, most of all, I want to thank you for the generosity of the time that you've, you've, you've shown us today. Thank you for what you do for our profession. Thank you.